we have to reject them and ultimately ban the use of digital handcuffs. We've also seen digital handcuffs on music. Around 10 years ago, we started to see things that looked like compact discs, but they were not written according to the specifications for a compact disc. And the reason was to try to stop computers from reading them. So we called them corrupt disks. And in some European countries, they were legally required to be labeled. They couldn't say the compact disk symbol. They had to have a different symbol. Uh, and that was a good thing. It enabled people to refuse to buy them. I once gave a speech in Spain about this topic. I had been invited by part of a regional government. And therefore, they gave me some books with beautiful photos of the region and some discs of music from the region. And one of them was by a musician I'd heard of, so I wanted to listen. But fortunately, before I opened the package, I saw that instead of the compact disc logo, it said copy control. This disc can be played with Windows and Macintosh systems, <laughs> meaning no use at all for me. So I gave it back to them and I said, here you see the face of the enemy. <laughs> Please return this to the store because they shouldn't keep your money. And I've never heard that music. Well, that's a small sacrifice to make for freedom. Sony had a clever idea for making corrupt discs. Instead of writing the tracks in a squiggly way that computers couldn't read, they hoped, they, their idea was to write the, the data normally, but put a program on the disc so that if you put the program into, if you put the disk into a computer, that program would run and it would change the system to restrict how the user could look at that music. This program was similar to a virus or worm and it was known as a rootkit. It's the same thing that crackers use to take control of a computer once they gain access to it. Uh, and this is illegal, by the way. That would, Distributing that software was a major crime. Uh, and uh, not, not only did this program take control of the computer and change the system to interfere with access to the disk, it also changed the system so that if you tried to look inside the system to see if this was present, it would not show up. And also change the command you could use to delete it so that it wouldn't really delete the stuff. So this was one serious crime, but not the only one. You see, some of the code in this program had been copied by Sony from a program released under the GNU General Public License. Now, the GNU General Public License is a special kind of free software license. A free software license is simply a license that gives you the four freedoms for a program. But the GNU GPL is a copyleft license. <coughs> uh, and that means, yes, you're free to take pieces of the code and put them into other programs that you write. But there's a condition. Any program you distribute that includes any of the GPL covered code must as a whole be released under the GNU GPL. So you have to respect other people's freedom the same way we respected yours. And Sony was free to use that code, but in order to do so legally, it had to release its pro whole program under the GNU GPL and give users the source code and give them a copy of the GPL so that they would know their rights. Sony did not do that. That was commercial copyright infringement, which, thanks to an unjust law purchased by companies like Sony, is a serious crime in the US. 
So, two felonies. Sony was never prosecuted for either of them. Because US officials understand that the purpose of copyright law is to enable companies like Sony to have power over citizens. However, the users who were victimized by this malicious software sued Sony. Unfortunately, they focused their condemnation on the nasty methods that Sony used and not on the nasty purpose, namely to restrict what people could do with the music in these discs. As a result, Sony was able to settle the suits by promising that in the future, when it restricts people, it won't use those particular methods. And Sony learned its lesson because the PlayStation 3 was designed with the root kit built in, and it was supposed to be impossible to remove. The use of DRM on music mostly disappeared around five years ago. But it's coming back because there are now streaming services which distribute music over the internet, and they require the user to use a non-free client program to listen. And the reason is to restrict the user. You see, one natural, obvious feature would be to save a copy of the piece on disk. But they don't want the users to be able to do that. So, they send the music encrypted in a secret way and require the user to run a non-free program to listen. And the reason it's non-free is to restrict the user. So it's very important to oppose and resist the use of those streaming services. Out, out, damn Spotify. We've also seen <coughs> digital handcuffs on books. The first attempt to distribute ebooks was around 10 years ago, maybe 12. And of course, they distributed the books in secret encrypted formats for the purpose of restricting the users. One publisher thought that it could get its line of user restricting ebooks selling with a bang if it started with a biography of me. So the publisher found an author who came to me and asked to be <coughs> and asked to uh, for my cooperation and I said only if this book is published without encryption and people are free to share it. The publisher wouldn't accept that so uh, the project was killed. <laughs> but then we found another publisher who was willing to accept that. In fact, who wanted to publish it on paper, but also posted the text under a free license. So the book was sold for a while, and, uh, and by the way, the FSF published a revised version about a year ago. Uh, you can order it. It's my semi-autobiography because it has the it has Sam Williams's point of view and my point of view in contrast. In any case, ebooks were a flop ten years ago. People just didn't want them. I'm not sure why, but at the time, I said, we should not let our guard down. We can't assume that this is because people value their freedom. The publishers will try again. And we have to prepare and fight back now. And they tried again. And this time, I'm sad to say, they're having more success with their completely unethical ebooks.
Now, I don't see anything wrong in principle with a book represented in digital format. But when that is used as an excuse to take away our traditional freedoms, then it's wrong. And that's what they do. I explained about the Amazon swindle and how it denies us the freedom to get a book anonymously. The swindles, the books are only available for the swindle from Amazon. And Amazon makes users identify themselves. It's impossible to go to the Amazon store and pay cash. So the result is that Amazon has a giant database which lists every book that each user has obtained for the swindle. And that kind of database is a threat to human rights. We must make sure that such databases do not exist. And then there is a freedom to give, lend, or sell the book, which is eliminated using the digital handcuffs. And then there is the back door. Any one of these is enough reason to reject it permanently and firmly. So I will never get an ebook that has any of those malicious features. And that means there's certain books I can't read. Well, that's life. Freedom sometimes requires a sacrifice. Those who are unwilling to make a sacrifice to keep their freedom are likely to lose it soon. So get in the habit of thinking in terms of making some sacrifices to keep your freedom for the long run. <clears throat> so this is what's happening to copyright law. It is being made stricter. The exact opposite of what's called for, which is to reduce copyright power. A government that wanted to represent its citizens would say, copyright restricts the citizens too much. We have to give the citizens back the freedom that they now can exercise and want to exercise. But how much should we reduce copyright power? Here are my suggestions. First of all, there's the dimension of time. I suggest that copyright last for 10 years, starting from the publication of the work. Why starting from the publication? Because before the work is published, we don't have copies of it. So it doesn't matter to us what copyright would say about them. It only starts to matter when the book is, work is published. So why not let the artist have as long as it takes to arrange the publication of the work and then start the clock? Why 10 years? Because it's plenty. In the US, and I think in many other countries, the usual publication cycle nowadays is three years. That is, within three years, the work is out of print. Well, 10 years is more than three times that, so it ought to be comfortably long. But I'm not saying that 10 years is the exact right amount. It's a rough suggestion. Not everyone agrees with it. I once presented these ideas in a panel discussion with fiction writers. And an award-winning writer on the panel said, 10 years, that's intolerable. Anything more than five years is too much. I was surprised. Until that moment, I had been fooled by the publishers. The publishers, when they demand increased power, say it's for the sake of the authors. Well, that's perhaps 10% true and 90% lie. There's a saying that a half-truth is worse than a lie. Well, this is a 10% truth, which is a lot worse than a lie. 
The 10% or maybe less that's true is with stars whose books won't go out of print and they make lots of money. And they also perhaps want more copyright power. But with all the other authors, it's false. This prize-winning writer had not been tremendously successful and his book appeared to be out of print. And he was getting mail from his fans saying that they would really love to be able to get a copy of the book. So he went to the publisher and said, our contract says that if the book is out of print, the rights have to revert to me, so I should be able to make copies and distribute them to my fans, right? The publisher said no. The publisher refused to admit that the book was out of print and was using the copyright on his own book to stop him from distributing copies, which he wanted to do so that his fans could read them and appreciate the book. He had come to the conclusion that more than five years of copyright were not likely to ever do him any good. But he knew that they could do him harm. So he said nothing more than five years. Well, if everyone else wants five years, I won't refuse. But I'm just being a little more cautious when I suggest 10 years. And I'm not saying that 10 years is exactly the right length. I propose it as a first adjustment. And after that, well, 10 years is still too long, we could shorten it, or maybe 12 years is better. I, I'm not going to fuss about that level of detail. But then there's the more important question of the breadth of copyright. Which uses of copyright works should be covered by copyright? For this, I distinguish three categories of works. First, there are the works that are meant for doing practical jobs with, which I could call functional works works meant to be used. Then there are the works that state what certain people thought. And then there are works of art and entertainment whose purpose is in the impact of the work. So these are three different ways that a work can make a contribution to society. And based on the different kinds of contribution, I have different conclusions. First of all, there are the works meant for used to do practical jobs. These include programs, recipes for cooking, educational works, reference works, text fonts, and some other things as well. These works must be free. The users must have the four freedoms. And the arguments are basically the same as the ones for software. Freedom means having control of your own life. So if you do a job in your life, you should have control of that job, which means you need to have control of any works that you use to do the job. So you must be free to change it. You must be free to you, first of all, to use it as you wish. You must be free to change it. And if you've changed it, for society's sake, you should be free to publish your changed version because it may be useful for other people as well. But once you're allowed to publish modified versions, it's absurd to stop you from republishing without change because that would only make you make changes that don't really have an effect so as to legalize your publication. It's much better just to say, yes, you can republish. And there we have the same four freedoms that define free software. The reason that these freedoms are needed is so that users can have control of the program. And the point is, for works that are meant for doing practical jobs, users need to have control of all those works, and it's the same four freedoms that they require. So, this means not only that copyright should let people have these freedoms, 
but nothing else should take them away either. These works need to be free. Now, someone might object and try to spread panic, saying, oh, but if we insist on being free, nobody will make the works and it will be a disaster, so we have to surrender our freedom. Well, 20 years ago, we couldn't be sure they were mistaken. But now, we can see that they are mistaken. If we look at all the free software that's already in, in use, and then we look at free reference works such as Wikipedia, and then we look at the free educational works that are starting to come out, we see that there is no need for such despair. We can have our freedom and have works to use. And there are plenty of free fonts now also. We have to really push on that one. So, this is the first category, the works meant for practical use, they should be free. But what about works that state what certain people thought? To publish a modified version of those works is to misrepresent the authors. That's not a useful thing. So I don't see any reason why people should be allowed to publish modified versions of these works. And if they're not allowed to publish modified versions, then there's no argument for allowing them to republish commercially at all. But there is a minimum freedom that we must have, and that's the freedom to share. By sharing, I mean to non-commercially redistribute exact copies. People must be free to share copies of all published works, because that is what turns copyright back into an industrial regulation that we can live with. The reason copyright today is intolerable is that it's being used to stop people from sharing. It's being used as the basis of the war on sharing. And the war on sharing is evil because sharing is good. Sharing must be legal. Sharing copies of any published work must be legal. So sharing is the minimum freedom. It's much less than the four freedoms that define a free work. It's a part of freedom too. So what I say therefore about works that state what certain people thought is users must be free to share those works to non-commercially redistributed exact copies. So I propose a partially reduced copyright system that would cover all commercial use and all modification. But the non-commercial redistribution of exact copies, that must be legalized. What about artistic and entertainment works? Modifying them can be useful. It can be a contribution to art. So, to, so that's an argument in favor of allowing modification. However, it's not urgent to do so. You could afford to wait 10 years to publish your modified version. So what I recommend for these works is the same partially reduced copyright system which covers all commercial use and all modification, but everyone is free to non-commercially redistribute exact copies, in other words, to share. But this would only last for 10 years. And then the copyright would expire and people would be free to publish modified versions. Now, with copyright lasting as long as it does today, you can't wait that long. If you make a modified version of some artistic work, well, you might have to wait 100 years before you're allowed to publish your version. That's not a solution. But if copyright expired in 10 years, 
the longest you would ever have to wait is 10 years, and that's, that's okay. <clears throat> so there's one other question we need to address, and that's remix. Remix means taking pieces of various works and putting them together into something that's new and totally different from those, from, from the things where you got those pieces. And remix simply should be legal if the purpose of copyright is to encourage works and not simply to hold back society then we must not construe it in a way that bans making new works. <clears throat> so, remix has to be legal. Now, with these changes, the copyright system would continue in categories two and three to provide income to the artists in pretty much the same inadequate fashion as it does now. And nowadays it really is mostly inadequate. Uh, you, there are a few stars who get rich, and aside from them, the system is failing. And it would be more or less the same, maybe a little less, but it wouldn't make much difference. We, the stars would still do okay, and everyone else wouldn't have any more hope than they've got now of being supported properly by the copyright system. So we should legalize sharing because that eliminates the tyranny of the existing system. But we might want to support artists, artists better than the existing system does now. I have two methods, two proposals for how to do that. One proposal uses the state. Suppose that the state spent a certain amount of money by distributing it to artists based on their popularity. Now, where would this money come from? It could just come out of the general budget, or it could come from special taxes for instance, a tax on internet connectivity. It doesn't matter much which way this, the money is collected because it won't be that much money. This system will be more efficient than the existing one, and therefore the amount of money we spend would be less than we spend now. So, the crucial thing is how to use the money. What I said is to distribute it to artists based on their popularity. Well, this means we have to measure their popularity. How should we do it? Not by surveillance of everybody's activities. That would be an injustice. Instead, by polling, sampling, people could be invited to participate and could say no. So you get enough of a sample and you can measure the popularity of everyone. Um, except when their popularities are very low. But that doesn't matter, because they would get so little money it, doesn't, it wouldn't matter much anyway. The crucial thing is, how do you go from the popularity measurements to the amount of money? The obvious way is a bad way. The obvious way is linear proportion. So if A is a thousand times as popular as B, a would get a thousand times as much money as B. Well, this just shows you why it's not a good way. Because a star could easily be a thousand times more popular than a fairly well-known good artist. But if we gave the star a thousand times as much money as B, we'd be wasting most of the money making the stars richer. This is not a useful thing to do with our money. So I propose to use the cube root, which looks sort of like this. The point is, we take the, we take the cube root of each artist's popularity figure, and then we distribute the money in proportion to the cube roots. This way, if star A has a thousand times the popularity of 
fairly good artist B. A will get 10 times as the money of B. Not a thousand times, but 10 times. Which means that A will get somewhat less and B will get a lot more compared with linear proportion. So the effect of the cube root is to shift most of the money to the artists in the, medi in the middle range of popularity, the ones who are not stars but are fairly successful. And this way, with less total money, we can support much more artists adequately. And thus, we could do a much better job of supporting the artist than the existing system. Of course, the existing system gives a lot of money to businesses as well, and we would save all of that. So this system would have two improvements in efficiency. With less money than we're spending now, we could support the artist much better. And that's why it doesn't matter precisely where the money comes from. If we're spending less money, we don't need to fuss about that question. <clears throat> the other proposal is with voluntary payments. Suppose each player device had a button you could push to send one euro to the artists. And you could push it if you want. But nothing tries to force you. You don't have to. It's entirely up to you. But if you do, you'll feel good. Lots of people will push it and feel good. Each country would adjust the amount of money to be sent so as to maximize the total that gets sent for you. Obviously, if the amount of money is too large, fewer people will send it. Maybe the total sent goes down. On the other hand, if the amount of money is really small, even if everybody pushes the button, the artist won't get much. So there will be some optimal amount. But it will depend on the general amount of money people have. Uh, I would s normally suggest maybe one euro or half a euro, I don't know. The point is, why don't you give money now when you like the work? Because it's too much trouble. You might, you, you, most of you might be willing to give a euro to some artists every day. But the work you have to go through Except in the case where they're playing on the music on the street and you pass by, then it's easy. But to do it over the internet, it would be a pain in the neck. <laughs> so I'm proposing to make it so easy that the only reason you wouldn't send it is the value of the money you would send. And that's so little reason, it's such a small amount, that people will send it. Of course, some won't. There are poor people who can't afford to give one euro to artists, maybe not even once a month. Well, they don't have to. We don't need to squeeze money out of poor people to support the arts. There are enough non-poor people who will be happy to send one euro now and then. So let the poor people not do it. And if we would like people to support the arts more, we could have a friendly, kind public relations campaign. Have you pushed, have you sent one euro to some artists this week? Why not? You, if you love seeing something, you'll feel good, push the button. Contrast this with the nasty publicity that they use trying to tell you that if you share, you're a pirate, that sharing is theft, which is, of course, bullshit. <laughs> it's not true. Not even legally true, let alone true in reality. So. 
These are the two systems I propose to support the arts. There, many variations are possible. They can be combined in various ways. Uh, for more information about free software, look at GNU.org. There is also the Free Software Foundation, FSF.org, where you can find various resources and you can also join. We need your support. We can't win this fight without your help. You can join the Free Software Foundation through FSF.org if you want to use e-commerce. But in addition, you could pay your dues in cash here and throw out a card if there's another way to be a member. There's also the Free Software Foundation of Europe at fsfe.org. You can join that too. Please support the cause. And there's also a campaign against ebooks that attack users' freedom. Look at stallman.org slash articles slash ebooks.pdf. Now it's time for the auction of the adorable GNU. <laughs> this is an adorable GNU that needs a home. So I'm going to auction it on behalf of the Free Software Foundation. If you are the purchaser, I'll be happy to sign the card for you. And if you have a penguin at home, you need to get a GNU for your penguin. <laughs> because as we know, a penguin can't hardly function without a GNU. to notice, right? What good is bidding if I don't notice? And uh, we can accept payment either in cash or with a credit card. If the credit card will work for telephone orders, it will also work with us. Uh, and uh, I'm going to start at uh, 20 euros, which is about, do I, how much? I've got 20. Do I get 25? <laughs> I've got 25. Do I get 30? How much? I've got 30. Do I get 35? I've got 30 euros. Do I get 35? How much? I've got 35. Do I get 40? I've got 35 euros. Do I get 40? I've got 40, do I get 45? <laughs> I've got 40, do I get 45? How much? I've got 45, do I get 50? How much? I've got 50, do I get 55? I've got 50, do I get 55? I've got 50, do I get 55? How much? How much? I've got 55. Do I, do I get 60? I've got 55. Do I get 60? Do I get 60 euros for this adorable canoe? I've got 55. Do I get 60? Do I get 60 euros? Do I get 60 euros? Do I get 60 euros to the Free Software Foundation to defend freedom? How much? I've got 60, do I get 65? I've got 60, do I get 65? Do I get 65 for this adorable? <laughs> do I get 65? Do I get 65 to the Free Software Foundation to defend freedom? Do I get... How much? How much? 65. Okay, I've got 65. Do I get... Because you can bid more if you want. <laughs> it doesn't go without saying. I've got 65. Do I get 70? I've got 65. Do I get 70? 
Do I get 70 euros for this adorable canoe? Do I get 70 euros to the Face Software Foundation to defend freedom? I've got 65. Do I get 70? Do I get 70? Last chance to bid 70 or more. Do I get 70? I've got 65. Do I get 70? Last chance to bid 70 or more. Going. Going. <laughs> going for 65.
but not all open source software is free. However, almost all open source programs are free. There are a few exceptions. There are two kinds of exceptions. There are, because the criteria of open source are written very differently and were interpreted by different people, the line didn't get drawn at exactly the same place. And it turns out that there are a few licenses which were accepted by the open source people, but we consider them too restrictive. Fortunately, those licenses are rarely used. You probably will not encounter any software under those licenses. The other case where the boundaries of free software and open source are different has to do with tyrant products. A tyrant product contains software but won't let the users change it. The manufacturer can, re can provide a new version which can be installed, but the user who owns the machine can't do this. And now, there are products which have, there are tyrant products which have free software in them. At least, the source code is free software. But, since you can't replace that software inside the product with your own version, we say that executable is not free. So the source code is free, but the executable is not. Now, the open source people are not concerned with this issue. They only ask whether the source code is open. They only ask about replacing the executable. Your thoughts on project uh, crowdfunding projects, such as project, such as can project funding uh, projects like crowdfunding, like Kickstarter. It's a good idea. And uh, should we enforce the, the, that the projects should be free, or so, so well, I get, it's a strange question. I mean, obviously, you shouldn't contribute to making any non-free program because you'd be a fool if you used it. But all software ought to be free. The question is, should non-free software be prohibited by law? In the short term, I don't propose to do that because it would be too radical a legal change and society is not ready for it. If you prohibit things that lots of people want to do, they disobey and that is a bad thing. So, what I propose is to teach people why they'd be fools to use a non-free program and help them stop. Someday, though, if most people understand how foolish it is to use a non-free program and how dangerous they can be, maybe it would be okay to legally ban or at least limit the distribution of non-free software. I won't, I'm not against it in principle, but under today's circumstances, I wouldn't recommend it. Good afternoon. Uh, first thing, I want to know, what's your opinion on the numbers? And things like, for well, Black March. I can't hear you. Uh, Black March. That yeah, I don't know what that is. Sorry. Uh, it's an idea by Anonymous that during the month of March, we should not hold anything. Um, Pirates, that is. Games, movies. Sorry, they what everything? <laughs> Don't download anything. Uh, from pirated sources, that is. Well, I can't see why you would do that. I mean, in any case, though, but this is ridiculous. What do you. I mean, I don't think that the pirates distribute much. What they do is they capture ships. <laughs> if you're talking about forbidden sharing, if, you're, if we're talking about forbidden sharing, I will not call that piracy. I refuse to repeat that propaganda terminology. However, uh, I don't see any reason why people shouldn't share this, uh, this coming month. Why shouldn't they? 
So if the proposal is stop sharing for a month, why? I see no sense in that. Uh, the, the reasoning behind the anonymous idea was that uh, uh, since most companies say that someone who pirates a software, a movie, etc., is not going to buy a legitimate version, they want to show that even without the people pirating, it, they won't buy it. It won't work. It won't work. And you shouldn't call it pirating because you're repeating propaganda of the enemy. <laughs> I know, but you shouldn't. That's the point. You shouldn't use their terms. If you speak using their prejudice terminology, you're helping them every time you say those words. In any case, that protest won't work. If everyone did it, it might prove a point. But, of course, you never get total participation in any protest. And if only 5% of the people participate, it won't prove anything. So it makes no sense as a strategy. In any case, what Anonymous usually does is protest at websites. Uh, the uh, the oh. kind of protest that Anonymous normally does is the equivalent of a physical protest in front of a building where some evil organization is acting. And I think that they're both legitimate. Uh, another question. You mentioned Windows, Mac OS, and iOS, but you didn't mention Android. What's your take on Android? Android, in theory, is free software, but it's not complete. Uh, there is no Android device that can run without proprietary software. For more information on this, look at gnu.org slash philosophy <laughs> slash Android and users freedom. <laughs> speak louder, I can't hear you. Please be quiet. My question is about Oh, my question is about Google, also about the Android open source project and it's released under uh, Apache license that I believe it's FSF uh, approved. But it's a free software license. So it's not exactly approved. We can't approve or not approve the license. There's a criterion for free software, and a license either satisfies it or not. So we we judge them, but we judge them following the standard, and uh, it's so they don't need our approval. If a license qualifies as a free software license, then it is a free software license, even if we've never seen it. Yeah, my, my question is, for instance, uh, Android Honeycomb never saw public release of its source code. Obviously, that was not free software. And so, what, what should we support Android or, or? Well, sorry, that's too vague a question. Because, because okay, Andro okay, yes, Android, okay, yes, Android version three, Android version three source code, I believe, was not released. Although maybe it was released later, I can't remember. For so four is released with not three. Later and three was not even released. So oh. I, I believe they should lose the. the Sorry, the lose Apache, what? It's a patch license. It's and not, you don't understand that you don't. That's meaningless. Lose it. They have to. There's no approval that they need to get from anybody. So there's no way they can lose it. Uh, what we can do is say <coughs> that the versions whose source is not released were not free software. Okay. Obviously, they don't care what we say about it, but we say this. Uh, but, okay, well, version 4 source code is released, uh, but unfortunately, it's not sufficient. That software by itself isn't enough to run anything. Hello. Uh, today, the uh, technology is a is a business, and uh, Windows and, and Mac OS uh, are sold. You can go and buy a copy of it. You can distribute. You can share it on the internet. <coughs> well, I consider that an injustice. Yeah, sorry. Uh, I completely, completely agree with you. But uh, I think that I want to know what you, an idea of yours to to 
keep the, the, the companies running? Well, I don't want to keep those companies running. Because, because the company's business is to subjugate people. I want it to disappear. No, that's because, because if, if uh, all software is, is free, including, for example, imagine that Microsoft Windows is free, and you can go and download it, or you can also and, so, and you, you can change, change it. Change it and share it with yeah. everyone. Okay. Uh, I think that society will stop uh, donating uh, money to the company. They will well, just. It doesn't because matter. Because this is people, just a little detail. Yeah. It's not important. A little detail that can bring. It's not big important. Done. Well, the point, <clears throat> I guess I don't follow that. Now I don't understand. You asked how can we keep these companies going, but I don't have that goal. What those companies are doing now is an injustice, and I want to stop it. Yeah, but I think there is a way to uh, stop that, in, that injustice. To be, yeah, to, to have a balance between. I don't want a balance. <laughs> I, I'm not willing to accept a balance between freedom and injustice. I want freedom, period. And I won't use that software. I think that you shouldn't use that software. You're hurting yourself if you use that software. It's software that nobody should tolerate. I, I and I want it to be gone. Uh, now, if it were free, if Windows were made into free software, then my criticism would end. It would no longer be applicable. I'm going to wait a moment because we more talking. So, I object to Windows because it's not free software. If it were free, I would no longer criticize it. I might like or dislike some technical things, but in ethical terms, I would have no criticism anymore. So then I would say, if anybody makes money from developing Windows, good, because you're making money from free software. And in fact, there are companies that develop free software and make money from it, and that's good. Yes, I, I agree with you, but how do I say this? People today are mean. I, I see that because Well I want to change that they, yes, but they just don't don't they No not they, everybody. They, they, no, you're they, exaggerating. They, if it's free, then I don't have to pay anybody. I don't have to donate Well anybody. they don't have to. They don't they have, have to. to. But if they do that the technology Will stop being right. The so scale. I think people will see that it's useful sometimes to donate to various technological development projects, and people are starting to see this. There are crowdfunding projects which have succeeded. So people are starting to realize that even if they don't have to contribute any money, it may be wiser to contribute some. Another question. Uh, I don't know if you know about humble indie bundle. You ever heard? I've heard of it. My understanding is those games are not free software. They are they are um, IRM free and but they're not free software. Some of them don't, some of them are and okay, well, I can I, donate the the money you want if they're not it's soft, if it's software and it's not free, then I don't consider it ethical. Basically I'm not willing to say it's good because it's more ethical than the usual thing. I've got a line. This line is free software and proprietary software. This line separates them. If it's distributed as free software, it's distributed in an ethical, acceptable way. And if it's distributed as proprietary software, it's not ethical and it's not acceptable. So the Humble Indie Bundle contains some games which are proprietary software, but they're not as nasty as some other proprietary software. Well, that's true. I agree, they're not as bad, but that's not enough. Because this isn't just a matter of comparison with other things that are worse. There's a, there are certain freedoms that the user should have. And if we don't have those freedoms, I won't take that software. I wouldn't take it if you paid me. Uh, I have not a question, but more of an opinion to, to give to you. Is that